behind me you can see the cancer research shop windows but they are unusually empty any other year you would be seeing Leslie Hills painting right here she is painting the people of Lewis they are many recognizable faces today we're speaking to one of these people behind the paintings. How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> Entire programme, I think. Well, Leslie's a super lady and uh, very much a part of this town, which I like to think I am. And um, I used to see her in the windows and I noticed all the wonderful portraits there of famous people, obviously. But basically, um, Leslie was a friend. Um, I used to pop into her shop uh, the cancer research shop and um, we got to know each other and I think she suggested um, she suggested that uh, perhaps I had a portrait and I thought well not a bad idea why not a bit of fun and it's raising money for a good cause cancer research or RNLI so I said yeah fine okay I didn't do a sitting or anything like that and it's wearing that scarf so yeah, I was very pleased to do that. Um, it's a bit of an ego trip as well, uh, but why not? And all the other side of it, obviously, people with their pets and children and, you know, memories, which are terribly, terribly important. I was born in 1936, which is a long time ago, but it was a very good year because we had three kings, the Crystal Palace burnt down in London, and, uh, I was born in Croydon, which is South London, in Thornton Heath, which is even more South London. So that was me, born in 1936, only child. Mum had the baby in a nursing home, because in those days women did do that sort of thing. Um, and of course it was just before the Second World War. So what I remember of the Second World War is very little, except for one thing, and that is that as a small child, as a baby, I used to be fed banana mashed up with cream and sugar. And obviously the war meant there were no more bananas. And so as far as I was concerned, I wasn't really too bothered about Adolf Hitler and what was going on. I was far too young, but I was very concerned that there were no bananas. And on one occasion, I was in Southbourne in Bournemouth which is, we were evacuated there, the family. And the greengrocer was serving in the Far East and he brought home um, some bananas and he raffled those bananas. And one of them was won by my girlfriend at the time who was called Mary. Mary knew that I liked bananas and offered the banana to me. And would you believe it, I actually refused to have it because I had read somewhere that Adolf Hitler was dropping identifiable objects into the streets, which, when you pick them up, exploded. So I thought that she was handing me an exploded bomb as a banana. But finally, I did accept it. And then I had to decide whether to mash it or whether to slice it up. And that was a big decision at the age of about seven. Um, actually, uh, I went to a school in Croydon um, the careers master on one wet day, similar to today, went round the class and said, uh, what do you want to be, Martin? Well, I'd like, I'm going into banking, sir. Right, that's good, fine, said Percy Ewins. Um, uh, Dean, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to run a cafe, sir. Fine. Um, Hentu, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to broadcast. And then the bell rang at the end <laughs> of the class. And so that was the only career advice I received, nil. So it was a bit frustrating. I did national service. I served in the Royal Air Force, 2728589 is my number. Uh, if there is a third world war, I will probably be uh, serving the Queen with my Olivetti because I was a typist in, in the Air Force for two years. Came out of the Air Force, went back to my first job, which was Shell Petroleum. I worked for Shell because my father worked for Shell. I got very fed up with it because I was a, a number. Uh, I wanted to be an individual. I've always believed in the individual. I decided that the best thing to do would be to get into journalism. So I applied to a newspaper in Croydon. 
in 1958-9, I was accepted by the Croydon Advertiser and I became a reporter on that newspaper. But after that, um, only six months later, I had a rich uncle in America, or at least I thought he was rich. His name was Uncle Harry, and he was a horse polo trainer for the Santa Barbara Port Polo Club, which is big time on the west coast of America. So I wrote to Uncle Harry and I said, would he support me if I came over? I wanted to learn about radio in America. Foolishly, he said he would. I wasn't able to work in broadcasting because I wasn't a member of the union. So um, I used to do English voices. Uh, I was quite good at this, you know, very nice. I'd say, why don't you go down to Chuck's Motorola and TV on State Street? They've got an amazing bargain. John, that's very good. Could you do that again, John? So that went very well, but ultimately I got homesick. I missed my girlfriend at the time. Um, so I decided to come home. And I came home and would you believe it, I went back to the Croydon Advertiser. And that's quite enough up until 1962. <laughs> There's more. Well, all right, 1962. Um, the uh, job came up with an airline called British European Airways, BEA, famous airline at the time, now part of BOAC or British Airways. And um, so I applied for the job as a feature writer with uh, BEA, got the job and for three, five years, an amazing, amazing five years in the 60s when I accompanied the Beatles to Stockholm uh, Sean Connery and James Bond to Istanbul, Fall from Russia with Love, Hayley Mills to Crete, uh, an amazing job for five years. Why did it end? It ended because the BBC decided to open local radio uh, throughout the UK and that's how we get into broadcasting. I applied for a job and amazed myself and everybody else by getting the job as sports producer for BBC Radio Brighton, which of course is not too far from the lovely town of Lewis. And we covered Lewis by radio uh, throughout my entire career there. I was 10 years full-time staff at BBC Radio Brighton. Uh, in fact, one of the first presenters and my main programme was at half past five in the morning. Now you're going to say, who the heck is watching or listening to the radio at half past five? And the answer is older people, perhaps, who can't sleep, may be in pain, feeling alone, fed up with the situation, whatever the situation. And there was the early bird show, which was at half past five until half past six. And it was a very friendly little program. We had a mascot, Worm, called Whirly. We used to talk to people. Hello, Whirly. Hello. How are you? I'm not very well. You're not very well, Whirly. Why is that? I'm tired. You're tired, I'm sorry about that. Are you going to go to bed? No. Why not? I don't like that. You, that sort of thing. That went on and on and on and people um, had photographs of Whirly the Worm. Um, and the other thing did, we, we actually adopted a duck um, to raise money for a wildfowl trust. And so we had a competition to see who could name the duck. And the winning entry was called Mrs Feather, which is quite a nice name for a duck. Why did the programme end? Because the BBC couldn't afford to pay me £70 a week to get up at five, £70 a week to get up at half past five in the morning. So they decided to axe the programme. There were protests. In point of fact, there were petitions outside the building, letters to Mrs Thatcher at the time. Um, but of course it had no, no good whatsoever and so the programme ended and I vanished off the airwaves but what I did was I moved wisely to Lewis. I built my own radio studio in a garage and we produced programmes for hospital radio throughout the United Kingdom for six years. And they had star guests like Petula Clark, like, well, you name it, we had star guests on this programme. And I've still got every single one of those audio cassettes and equally on an MP3. I like MP3s, tiny little memory stick, put it in, press a button and I can see any of those programmes or listen to any of those programmes with all the star names. I'm running out of voice. <laughs> People in the street, if 
The good thing about radio is people don't recognise you. I was recognised once when I was going to Brighton Railway Station, crossing the road just to get to the station, and there was a guy from St Dunstan's for visually impaired people, blind servicemen. And seeing that he was about to cross the road, I said, uh, are you OK? Can you, you, you want to help, any help? And he said, no, I'm fine, John. Now, this was a blind man, but the point is you recognise the voice. That's the nice thing about radio. Now, radio was very personal in those days, and that's why, in a way, people sort of reacted well to it. Um, people say, have you changed, John? And I say, no, I haven't changed at all. But what has changed is radio itself. It's become obviously far more sort of news orientated. Um, it's got to have the weather, it's got to have s fitted slots and also tight programs of music. I could do anything I liked for that one hour, basically because the manager at the radio station wasn't listening to the program, so he had absolutely no idea what was going on. On one occasion, I actually did the program naked, but the good thing about radio was nobody could tell, you see. It was a very warm day, I have to say. And you might say, well, what about other members of staff? Weren't they affronted? And I said, well, there weren't other members of the staff because I used to open the radio station, actually front door, go in, pick up the weather and ring up the bus station to find out about the buses and the trains. And I was on my own for at least the first 45 minutes. So radio has changed. Uh, there's far more of it now. Commercial radio, of course, I wasn't commercial radio. Um, and I'm a little disappointed with the way that it went. But that's changed, isn't it? Every, everything has to change. Um, when I was working in radio, um, one or two listeners wanted a record played and instead of phoning in, which is how things are done, uh, they would write in. Very often you wrote in and said, could I have Engelbert Humperdinck singing or the Beatles singing? Um, and to get their postcard or letter um, to my attention or anybody's attention, they would occasionally put them on postcards. And some of the postcards were Mabel Lucy Atwell postcards. She was famous as a postcard illustrator. And I used to say, for want of something to say, um, my goodness, you've got another Mabel Lucy card here. They're really nice. She was so charming, wasn't she? Everybody thought that was good. I decided to find out who the hell Mabel Lucy Atwell was. Did she exist? Was she Walt Disney in disguise, you know? So I actually found her family. I traveled across to her family who lived outside Marlborough in Wiltshire. I met her daughter, Peggy, and Peggy did an interview with me that was on Woman's Hour, which is a programme on the BBC Radio 4. Um, and it told this story that had never been told before on radio. A remarkable story about this amazing woman, Mabel Lucy Atwell, um, who is an example to all women. The best example of that, really, is that uh, as a young girl, she was never encouraged to do anything other than look after the boys in the family. It's a very big family in the East End of London. She used to do little sketches and encouraged by one of her sisters, she sent one or two sketches to Raphael Tuck, who are big postcard producers in London. Uh, she signed the letter in around oh, 1899, probably, M. L. Atwell. And they wrote back and said, dear sir, well done, we do like some of these sketches, please send us some more. And it took at least a year before they discovered, and by then it was too late, that they weren't dealing with a man. Shock horror, they were dealing with a woman. From that point onwards, she never looked back. I'd written for Viva Lewis, the magazine, for 10 years. Little jocular, funny little bits, a bit like the early bird show. Um, and people liked it and banged into people in the street, which was nice chatted to them, little brief little conversations, all reported in there. And over those 10 years, I met some very interesting people and did some very interesting things. So I thought, well, I might as well sum it all up in those 10 years, do a little book, and then try and raise a bit of money for the Friends of Lewis Victoria Hospital, which is very important to this town. And suddenly there was this little other magazine available, but free. I gave it away, obviously. But if people liked it, then uh, they could donate some money to the Lewis Victoria Hospital. And happily, we raised well over £500. And it's still doing very well. I must say that it's still available online, believe it or not. How you find it, you're... I haven't got a clue. I'm not very high-tech. I'm not digital. 
there used to be a really nice car boot sale in Lewis on a Sunday. And occasionally I would see Raymond Briggs down there and have the occasional chat. And I thought um, potential here. He produced a book about all the pieces he writes for a magazine called The Oldie Magazine, which is for old people like me. So I thought, I'll tell you what I'll do. Um, I'll write to him and say, could I sort of abridge some of these articles and maybe turn them into a play, uh, a radio play? And as I said, it's a long story, but basically he approved. He said, as long as I'm not involved, he said, you can do it. And again, we raised money for charity and we put on two shows and we were planning to put on another show in Lewis, but unfortunately the circumstances have changed and we can't do that. And it was a very, very funny little radio play all about this quite remarkable man, Raymond Briggs. So Raymond Briggs, Mabel Lucy Apple, Max Miller. And going back to the point I made much earlier, they were all individuals. You know, my message to anybody is, you know, anybody can be ordinary, try and be extraordinary. You know, it helps. Cut. <laughs>